So this next stretch here is going to be a little bit long, and I apologize for that. We maximize for content as opposed to perhaps comfort. So if you have to go potty, it's okay. We understand. You can just make your way out because uh, we're going to try and go all the way to five uh, for this next stretch. And I wanted to uh, give a few special thanks. Uh, one, Tara Nicole Nelson, I wanted to thank uh, her. She's a co-chair. You, you heard her speak earlier. She also co-chaired the event, so uh, she did a lot of the marketing work for us. I also wanted to thank Julie Leal, my partner and wife, who uh, has coordinated all the, mere, the hundreds of things that go into putting on an event like this. I wanted to thank her as well. You, you wouldn't believe the fact that she had literally over 300 line items of things to do in preparation for the conference, one of them being, have fun at the conference today. <laughs> so I hope we've checked that off today, uh, as well as all those handmade goodie bags were all uh, Julie's work, as well as the many volunteers. So if you see ever, anyone with the Habit Summit t-shirt, there are also volunteers who have helped us today, and of course, our speakers. So thank you all very, very much, and of course, our attendees. Um, also, I want to give a special thank you to Matthew for pointing out the effect of uh, the rain. So if you didn't like the Habit co Summit today, it wasn't actually because you didn't like it. <laughs> Matt's evidence proved that it was actually because of the bad weather. So, Okay. Next up, we have Jeff Atwood, who in 2008, along with Joel Spolsky, founded StackOverflow.com. I'm sure many of you use Stack Overflow. How many of you have used Stack Overflow in the past? Okay, a lot of you. Great. Today, Stack Overflow is the world's largest technical question and answer site. 5,000 questions get answered every single day. And today, uh, Jeff has focused his time on Discourse, an open source discussion platform. And today, he will be discussing with us the factors that go into creating a successful community habit. Please welcome Jeff Atwood. Great, thanks for having me, everyone. So first, I want to talk about this game, Glitch. I don't know if you guys know about this. This is a game. <laughs> I see there's some fans in the room. This is a, this is a game that was created by uh, Stuart Butterfield and a few other people. Stuart Butterfield was one of the creators of Flickr. But Glitch failed. Um, spoiler alert. <laughs> and, but it was a massively multiplayer online browser game, sort of. Um, I actually never played it. I, I heard about it. I looked at it. Um, but you'll notice one thing interesting about this, this screenshot is there's a little chat area on the right. It's a little fuzzy, uh, hard, hard to see. I'm going to come back to that. And the reason it failed was because people weren't coming back to the game. So essentially, all the, the, the reason we're all in the room is about creating habits and how websites create habits. And Glitch, the primary failure of Glitch was that it didn't create habits for the players that played the game. There was no reason for them to come back. And you can think, well, you know, games. Why, why do you come back to games? And there's the whole Zynga angle of you know, the sort of evil casino operators um, that get you to keep putting money in the slot machine. Um, there's World of Warcraft. There's games like Limbo, which have uh, puzzles and a very distinct experience. Now, these aren't necessarily multiplayer games. Um, World of Tanks is very, very multiplayer and huge. Um, and then something like Monkey Island, which is these progressive levels of difficulty that you get to. Players really couldn't figure out what they were supposed to do in the game, like why do I keep coming back here, what's the purpose of this? Um, and I think it's also interesting that people observe that Glitch never really sent email reminders when people weren't coming back to the game and sort of had a natural expectation that people would just come back to Glitch organically, and clearly they did not. Now, the coda to that is that, if I go back to this slide, the, there's a product here that they ripped out of Glitch called Slack. And I think you can see it on the right there. It's a chat system. And we actually use it, because my discourse team is a remote team uh, in, in France and Canada and Australia. And this is very essential to what we do. So it's interesting to think that out of this gameplay mechanism, the mechanism of communicating with other players became a product, and actually a very good one, at Slack.com. So it, it, it was one of those failures that led to another product. Um, so, Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about Stack Overflow. If you don't know Stack Overflow, I know a lot of people in the room know Stack Overflow, but it's a Q&A site for programmers. And it wasn't really intended to be addictive, right? Like, I didn't sit out and design Stack Overflow and say, hey, <laughs> I want people to, to come back so much that they don't get any work done. Stack Overflow was a site, <laughs> right, that, well, that's the funny thing. Stack Overflow was a site about getting work done. 
right? You go to Stack Overflow because you have a problem and you need to do something in the natural course of your work. Whether you're getting paid for it or not doesn't really matter, but it's, it solves problems that you have. That's a very essential design element of Stack Overflow. And when we designed it, you know, it turned out it was really, really addictive. This is kind of a side effect. Like, this is just me, and I've never actually done this Google search before, Stack Overflow Addictive. Now, I've seen many of these topics because these are meta topics that I've read on our meta site. But just the number of people talking about, gosh, yeah, Stack Overflow, you're like, I can't stop going. And <laughs> that was never, this was all sort of somewhat accidental. It's kind of side effecty. And one of those meta posts that I linked to, the guy who asked, if you look at the date, he asked that question on July 9th, uh, like 2009, and notice like clearly he wasn't helped by his question because he uh, continued to use Stack Overflow really, really extensively. He did not get unaddicted to Stack Overflow. So the design process for Stack Overflow was a little bit like building the Frankenstein monster because Joel Spolsky and I had an idea. The core idea was there was this site, Experts Exchange, which has a very unfortunate URL <laughs> if you think it through. And they were doing Q&A in a very overtly kind of evil way. Like they were tricking people. When you came to the site, you couldn't really see the answers. You had to sort of, they made this overture that like, oh, you, if you pay money, we can show you the answers. It wasn't really true because you can't do that on Google. If you scrolled all the way down, you could see the answer. But this was a very universally loathed website. But they had a core of a really good idea, which was questions and answers around programming. And Joel and I said, hey, we can do this, right, in a way that's not evil. <laughs> And then I started thinking, well, how can I get the behaviors that I want on this site? How can I get people to focus on the questions, focus on the work, focus on the problems? Because I've had enough experience with online community to know that left to their own devices, people just socialize. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, but, but when you're in an environment of learning and trying to get things done, that kind of gets in the way. So we built this Frankenstein monster of all the things we saw that were working that we liked. You know, from Wikipedia, we got this editability. From Dig and Reddit, we got the concept of voting, because voting does surface good content. Um, the blog concept of ownership, like I own this post, and I'm going to curate all the comments on it, because you know, I don't want any rude comments on my blog, and I want to look good, right? That's my blog. Um, and then, of course, forums, where people are just you know, communicating and trying to solve problems together. And we kind of mashed all this up into what became Stack Overflow. And this is part of the tour they developed for Stack Overflow, which is very, very good. If you go to Stack Overflow, it says take the two minute tour. It's really quite, quite good. And the core element is really um, peer acceptance. If you, if you look at Stack Overflow and break it down, the thing I knew about programmers was that they valued the opinion of other programmers. Like, if you want a programmer to get something done, you don't tell them, go do this. What you do is tell them, well, John said he could do this in like six hours. And they'll be like, oh my god, right? Like, they're super competitive. Um, and peer acceptance really matters. And like learning from your peers, it's like a very uh, integral part of the programming experience. So what you're seeing here is, is really peer review of the answers and peer acceptance of the good answers and peer rejection of the answers that don't make the cut for whatever reason. And the good stuff kind of floats to the top. And the net result is you never have to read very far to get a good answer. You arrive at the page, the question is at the top, and there's a good answer at the top, like really right under the question. It's like, this is great. This solves problems that I have in my life, right? And there's a reputation system that comes from that. So when people upvote your answers on Stack Overflow, when they upvote your questions, you get a reputation score, which is a measure of peer acceptance. It's just a number, right? We don't try to make a big deal out of it. It's like, you know, your life depends on this number. But um, anytime you put a number next to someone's name, you're in really dangerous territory. You have to be really careful with that. Because people will do whatever it takes. They've shown time and time again, if you put a number next to someone's name, they'll do whatever it takes to make that number go up. So the challenge for me at Stack Overflow was to say, you know, I only want this number to go up for things that I know are positive, that build the community, that where everybody's learning. That's the only way I want this number to go up. I don't want this number to go up for any other activity except the positive kind of activities that help the community. Um, and there's a lot of subtlety to the system. It's actually a very complex board game we play at Stack Overflow. If you love rule sets, and programmers love rule sets, right? That's what they do for a living. Um, you will enjoy the Stack Overflow system. And you know, we, we extended it to other topics as well, but it tends to be very data, fact, and science-oriented stuff that the engine is good at, where things can be verified to some degree of certainty. Not completely, but you know, it's not a system of opinion. The other thing that we did, and this is from the Xbox. I didn't include that in my little Venn diagram. But one thing I saw that I really liked on the Xbox was the system of as I play the game, the game is like rewarding me and telling me 
what's going on. And I'm learning the game as I'm playing it. So there's this system of badging that as you do things, you can seek these out, right? Or you can just have them happen to you as you use the system. You know, the first time you get an, a, an answer upvoted, that's a badge. Hey, good works. A peer accepted the answer that you put on the site. That's great. That's a positive activity. We, don't, we want you to do more of that. And these are all, there's, there's a few novelty badges in there, like tumbleweed. If you post a question that doesn't get any answers for a long time, it's like, hey, here's your tumbleweed. Sorry, didn't work out for you. <laughs> but badges are very, very strict. We have a positive only uh, lesson there of like we're only reinforcing the behaviors that we want to see on the site. So there's really you know, two ways you can look at this, sort of rejecting the negative activities, um, which in Stack Overflow we tried to do via minimization on the software side. Like we want to minimize discussion, so we made it hard for you to have discussions in the software. Um, you'll notice if you go to Stack Overflow and you want to start having conversations with people, it's like, well, this really sucks. Right? I can't have conversations with this guy. It's like, well, you're not supposed to have conversations with that person. You're supposed to answer the question. You know? And you might annotate some answers to get more detail about them, but you're fundamentally not supposed to be engaging in conversations here. That's not really what we do. So those are the, sort of the two axes of, of, of how we encourage with badges and discourage with design that makes it sort of just adds friction to the process where you're doing things that, that aren't wrong per se, but like aren't really what we're here to do. There's also... Uh, if you look at the, this is just one fragment of a user page on Stack Overflow, and it, this is a lot of data, right? And I've been accused of a guy who thinks of spreadsheets as like parties, and I guess to some extent that's kind of true. But if this is your user page, it has a lot of in interesting, inf relevant information to you about, you know, where your reputation is coming from. You know, what questions and answers did you ask that people were, your peers are accepting and say, hey, that's a great answer, that's a great question. I really, that, that helps me. Right? And, and I think the information here is good. That's where your reputation is coming from. Um, also, an interesting breakdown of questions and answers, like what, which questions did well, which questions got lots of views. Because if you ask a question on Stack Overflow that helps only you, that's okay, but that's not really the goal. The goal is to ask questions that help as many people as possible, right? Because that's how we move things forward, that's how we learn. So, votes is a measure of that, views is a measure of that. Um, you see that for most questions and answers here. You're also seeing a breakdown of, of where your reputation is coming from within um, the tags, like different skill areas that you have. If somebody's really good at jQuery, really good at Java, you'll see a breakdown there. So there's kind of an explosion of stats. And the, the main way we surface this, if I go back, if you go back to this, uh, this uh, picture here where it says John Doe, United States, there's just the core reputation number and then the badge count. So we don't want to overwhelm you with information, but the deeper you get into the game, uh, the more you start to look at these numbers. And you'll also notice that every sort order that we put on the page in Stack Overflow is extremely intentional. We don't say this is a leaderboard. We don't say optimize for this. We just say, look, here's the sort order that we chose. What do you think about that? Right? Because you know, I don't want to be in a position of where I'm telling people what to do. I have certain orders that I think matter that are the default for this page, but you can change them. So a couple different levels you can play the game at. Um, the first level is I'm only helping myself, right? Very selfish. That's okay. There's nothing that wrong about that as long as it generates something good for the community. Um, the second level is, you know, I'm here to help other programmers, right? And then the third level is I'm here to help the world. I'm here to help advance the craft of engineering, of software engineering. And you can play this on different topics. So what you're seeing here on accounts is uh, this particular user has... Um, He's on the English site, interestingly. Um, there's different topics that you can play this game on. So if, you, if you're not good at one of the particular games, one of the topics, you can switch. You know, it's the same rule set, completely the same rule set. You'll know it intimately. You're like, okay, this is risk, right? Um, but you're playing it on a different topic. And sometimes if you get over-engaged on a particular topic, you're like, I'm, I'm bored. I want more games to play. <laughs> we give you that. There's a lot of topics. Now, as I mentioned, the engine doesn't do well on all topics. It tends to be very data, fact, and science-based, or as I call, as Joel called it, the tome of knowledge topics, which English is. Um, badge counts you can see here. Uh, there's a bounty system where if you have a lot of reputation, um, you can, I don't want to say give it to other people, but there's a, there's a little bit of an economy around, I think a certain question has value, and I want to attach some of my reputation to that question and then 
give it to someone that answers it? Because I think this is an important question. This is, an important, this is a question that matters. So you can slice off bits of your own reputation. This also becomes another level of the gameplay, where if you're a really an expert at Stack Overflow, you're pretty much doing bounties most of the time. This is very, very high-level stuff. <laughs> but um, that's the way you can exceed the reputation cap every day, because we cap your reputation. Because I think I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we want you to actually get work done. We don't want you to be on Stack Overflow playing the game all day. So we capped, and this is a decision I made early on. I was like, no, we're just gonna have a cap, because it's crazy. Otherwise, you have a couple problems with the community. First of all, people get so far ahead that it's ridiculous. And second, like, you know, go program. You know, go, go do your job. <laughs> and I was very unapologetic about this. And of course, you know, people who play the game are like, this is bullshit, right? You can't limit me from getting points in this game. It's like, well, yes, I can. <laughs> Actually, right? And I think it's for your own good, right? You have to understand, like, let me explain to you why I'm doing this. It's like I do with my son. Like, look, I have rules, but they're for your safety, right? Like, I believe in these rules. <laughs> I don't want you guys to hurt yourselves. Um, but bounties are immune to all that. So if you're playing the game at that high of a level, then you seek out bounties because you're immune to the daily cap. It's another subtlety of the rule system. Um, we also show voting because this entire economy is really based on voting, right? And people who don't vote aren't really contributing to the economy of Stack Overflow. And that does become a problem, actually. We had some of the lower value questions or things that weren't really working out. People wouldn't vote on. It's like, well, you need to vote this down so that we get indication that this is bad signal, that this stuff should go away. And we're like, oh, I just ignore it. It's like, no, 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 you need to vote. <laughs> like, this, this stops working. This is like democracy. If you don't vote, things stop working. You understand that, right? Um, so we started putting the counts. Because again, if you put numbers in front of people, they optimize for those numbers. It's just you've got to be careful you're putting the right numbers in front of people for the right reasons, right? So really, I guess at a high level, three things. Like, learning is supposed to be fun, right? I mean, to some degree. Not to the degree that it starts interfering with the education where it's all entertainment, we're not actually learning anything, we're all socializing all the time. But this is supposed to be an entertaining process of, hey, I learned something today, that's awesome. You know? Today I learned, T-I-L. And games are really learning aids. Like a lot of programmers have deep backgrounds as gamers. In fact, the reason I'm a programmer is because my dad saw that I was playing a lot of video games. He's like, no, 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 you need to write your own video games. So I was like, really? I was like, I don't know, dad, if that, and he's like, yes, definitely. And so that's why I got a computer, was that my dad was very insistent that I would write a game. And it's interesting because it puts you in the mindset of the game designer. You're like, I'm a player, but I'm also a game designer, right? I control the rules. I'm not just a passive participant in the system. I'm actually engaging in it. And this is reflected in the design of Stack Overflow, where you can participate in an election to become a Stack Overflow moderator. If anyone in this room wants to become a Stack Overflow moderator, you could do that. We just had an election, in fact. And that's part of the system. You know, the community has power within the system. You're not just passive participants in this game, you're helping us build the game, you're helping us design the game as we go, because that's how communities work. And then the power of games, I really saw this with, again, going back to the gaming background, this game, Counter-Strike, which is kind of a multiplayer shooter game. But one thing that really struck me about this game is it's the first game I had played where everybody played as a team even when they didn't have to, because the rules of the game made it such that the only way to win the game was to play it as a team, right? And I was like, wow, this is a huge, deep insight, right? If I can build a game where everybody, the rules of the game, make it so that the only way to win is to help other programmers, then we all win. And it works for, you know, everyone on the planet. It's great. So the game is really learning. I want to be clear about that. When you play the Stack Overflow game, when you go to Stack Exchange and see those sites, they're all really fundamentally sites about learning. They are not sites for our personal entertainment. This is a big difference between something like Reddit or Dig and sites like that. There's nothing wrong with those sites, but they're primarily entertainment, and it's what I call learning by accident. Random walks through the encyclopedia. Which is okay, but I don't view that as a good way to learn personally. It's okay. It's very, very accidental. And the way to judge the game is, you know, whether the other people in the game view the way as the win, the way to win the game, and the only way to win the game, really, is to help other people learn programming. That's, that's the goal of the system. Now, I came out of that system in February 2012 because I had twin baby girls, and a bunch of other stuff was changing, the company was growing. We had kind of achieved our core mission. Um, but I wasn't really done because I realized that as good as the stack exchange system is, it really is limited to systems where you're talking about things that can be quantified with data, things that can be examined through science, things that can be verified through experimental interactions. And that rules out a lot of communities on the internet that have very, very bad software. 
or as I like to call it, forum software. Um, and I said, this is terrible. You know, there's a lot of communities that their, their only software options are, are bad software options. And startups would come to me and say, hey, Jeff, give me your advice on this thing. And I would say, well, why don't you ask your own community what they think of what you're doing? You know? and, then, and then the smarter ones would say, oh, great idea. How do I do that? And then I started looking at the state of forum software, which I had stopped looking at in, uh, in, in 2009, because I was like, we're not building forum software. And I realized there had been virtually no advancement in the field since then, certainly not on the open source side. Uh, there, there was nothing that I w would recommend installing on my own server. Certainly nothing I would recommend other people without, you know, with a straight face. So, uh, discourse was my idea. Now, this is, this is an early mock-up of the discourse homepage. Unfortunately, you can't, it's very, very dim. Um, but one of the things I messed up with on discourse early on was they had the idea that discourse was a system of debate, right? It was like we would have these studied debates in these wood paneled rooms, much like this one actually. <laughs> and we would, reach, we would reach a formal conclusion together. And the deeper I looked at it and I started designing the product, I realized that is wrong because you cannot have discussions unless people are fundamentally having fun. It has, it has to be a party at some level, it really, really does. To get people in the room to discuss things, you have to have a party. So rather than, this is actually um, from a Wikipedia article about um, some part of Canadian history that I don't understand with these, but it's also a bunch of white guys, right? That's also a problem. Um, but it actually looks more like this. This is actually something closer to what we're shooting for with this course. It's more about overt socializing, overt entertainment, and then you, the discussions you have are entertaining because hey, you've got a bunch of interesting people in the room because they were having fun, and then discussions happen as a side effect of that. Because unless you're having fun, there's gonna be nobody in the room. Nobody's gonna care, nobody's gonna come. You know, sort of circling back to the, to the glitch lesson of you have to build a game that's fundamentally engaging, that people wanna to come to and come back to every day. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how good your game is. I mean, everything else is really, really irrelevant at that point. And one way that I know we're doing pretty good on discourse is if you go to boing boing, uh, bbs.boingboing.net, boing boing was one of our early partners for discourse. There's a whole category here called games where they play these games on the forum with each other. They come up with these very, very complicated um, uh, uh, forum games that they play there, right? And I was like, this is it, this is good. This means we're succeeding. That was the goal of discourse, to make the interactions feel good. And so you're having fun, you're like, hey, this is a place I can hang out at. And by the way, there's some really interesting people here that I love talking to. And that's already true for me for the Boing Boing community. I love that community. But the game part is really, really um, essential. Uh, almost done. So you might say, what's fun? So I don't have time to talk about the discourse system because it's very subtle. The system uh, of how you manage social interactions and systems of opinion is extremely subtle. In fact, you may look at discourse and say, Jeff didn't do any work on reputation here, but I did, actually. Um, it's all under the surface <laughs> and mostly invisible. But a few key things is notifications are huge, email is huge. Um, I went from hating email to kind of loving it because that's the only thing every human that has a computer is guaranteed to have is pretty much email. Whatever services they're on, maybe they hate Twitter, maybe they love Facebook, they'll have email, believe me. Um, media, sharing media, like I, I used to joke in our Stack Overflow chat room that we would, um, we did YouTube-based uh, development where we just post YouTube clips of the various things that were happening. Um, sharing links, I mean this is the basis of Dig, this is the basis of Reddit, um, in a way that's very structured where you get the content link pops up automatically. And also to some extent real time, not to the extent that it's a chat system, because that is a different system, but the DNA you share between a chat system and a forum system is really, it's much deeper than I expected. But yeah, that's all I have, thank you very much. And if you're interested in any of this, please check out uh, the projects that I worked on. Okay, okay we'll take some questions. Oh, sure, okay, okay. So again, please make it up to the microphones if you have any questions. Or if you would like to just raise your hand, that's fine too. Yeah. <laughs> There's one over there for you. Uh, all right. So what you described from playing email before, the course of game, you know, you get to the disaster, the second disaster, and the second disaster, and the second disaster. What stops you from writing the shorter and the shorter game? There's no rule that you know you can stop it and make it shorter. So the question was about essentially Quora versus, I guess, Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange. And they are somewhat similar in the, their Q&A systems. I would say the main difference is that Quora believes that you can have a system where everybody's talking about everything at once, whereas on Stack Exchange and Stack Overflow, it's very siloed by topic. Stack Overflow is about programming. 
the English side is about English. So you attract experts that really love that particular topic. Um, and I find the Quora model very problematic personally. I mean, you know, I, I think if people are using Quora and enjoying it, that's great. But the way I view the world is you have communities of very specific experts that love a particular topic. And that's why you go there in the first place. Um, there's nothing stopping anyone from doing it from software as a service. That was another part of this question. But building these communities is a little bit different, difficult because it takes a lot of discipline around what questions do we ask, how do we answer things. Um, it tends to degenerate into socializing really, really rapidly, unless you control it and you have very strict rule sets, which we do at Stack Overall Stack Exchange. Um, those are my main observations. Yes. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about the word gamification. Like, th I, that word didn't exist when I started building Stack Overflow. In fact, I went to the Wikipedia article for it. I was like, wait, we're listed here. I was like, what the? Because I was like, I didn't do that. You know, really, <laughs> I, I think I, the way to think of this is like, what kind of behaviors do you want in your community? And how do you encourage the good behaviors and discourage the negative behaviors? Um, I think gamification works really well for that. I think it's, it's a very sharp scalpel. And I think a lot of people that use it don't understand what they're doing. <laughs> and it can cause a lot of suffering. Because, like I said, if you put a number next to someone's name, they're going to do everything they can to optimize for that number. You need to really think that through. I mean, fr from the angle of, like, the guy who's going to get up every day and do nothing but make that number go up. That's his entire purpose in life. That's all he's going to do. <laughs> I know this sounds weird, but this, this happens, right? <laughs> so it's a very sharp, sharp instrument. And I think the people that know how to use it are, are not that common. That would, that would be my main you know, observation. I don't think it necessarily needs to be everywhere either. But you know, I think it's, it's a great tool to have in your tool set. And I don't know, I have mixed feelings about the trend, the, the word. But you know, what behaviors do you want in your community? I think it's a very powerful concept. Yes? Well, it's interesting. So the question is about people who delight in torturing other people. <laughs> um, first of all, it's not as common as you would think, which is good. But like, I actually, working on Stack Overflow, I became much more positive about human nature than I would be. And the other thing that's really cool is that if someone is really mean to another person, nobody will upvote that. And a lot of people will downvote that, like just naturally. Cruelty does not get, unless you somehow develop an ecosystem of like, cruelty is the norm, then <laughs> that would be bad. Um, but in general, as long as you have rule sets, say, look, we don't tolerate this kind of stuff. You know, we're always civil to each other, no matter what. And we were very clear about this on Stack Overflow from day one. So look, it's about the programming, right? It's not about these personal vendettas. Look, just leave that at home. Just, just let's talk about the code. And we're not going to be mean to each other, right? And so we didn't have to do a lot of extra encouragement. Like, people downvote cruelty very consistently. So I think as long as you give them the tools and you have a direction statement, says, look, we don't tolerate this. Look here. It says we don't tolerate this. They will kind of help you do that. There's enough good-natured people. The good-natured people vastly outnumber the really negative people. Now, you will find, I guess the one ex exception is you, there's sort of the one in a million people that you'll find. <laughs> but those are so rare that, like, you can just handle them on a case-by-case -case basis, really. Like, it did come up. But there was just something wrong with these people, like, deeply, right? Um, and you try to help them. I feel bad, right? Because there's just something wrong, you know? You, I'm, you're trying to empathize. Discourse is a project of empathy. And you're like, well, what's, what's going on with this person? Why do they feel like they need to do this? And you can reach out to them and try, and try to help. But ultimately, it's just case by case basis. It's pretty rare. So that's the good news. It's all good news. Yes, in the front. Uh, Caps. How would caps translate into a monetized domain? I don't know that the marketing weasels would let you cap it um, if it's about the money coming in. Um, and I think we're really careful to say, look, this isn't about money. In fact, introducing money breaks the system. In fact, people would always say, hey, you know what would be cool on Stack Overflow? There's a little button you could tip people. It's like, no, 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 you don't even know what you're doing. Like, the minute you put that on there, the system is broken. You've just broken on our entire system. Good idea. <laughs> right? 
So I think you have to be very careful and say, like, systems based on money are really different than systems based on sort of reputation and woofy and sort of intangibles around social interactions. Um, I'm a big fan of the cap, but the funny thing about the cap is John Skeet, who's one of the, the guys at Stack Overflow who has a billion points of reputation, he's a, he's a brilliant programmer, loves helping people, he's a wonderful human being, but it's funny because John Skeet hates the cap. <laughs> and uh, the people who are really engaged will tell you that you should remove this, right? So it's kind of interesting. You kind of have to sort of be putting the brakes on some of your most avid users and saying, you know, I think this is really better for the rest of us, for everyone, if we have this, this, this cap system in place. Yeah. So Stack Overflow is really useful because of the engaged community. But to have that engaged community, you need questions and answers. But to have that, you need an engaged community. So how did you solve that chicken and egg problem when you started uh, the site? We, we don't really... So reputation comes from questions. There are a bunch of tweaks around reputation for questions because there's this disconnect between questions and answers. Like the question is the, the oyster and the answer is the pearl inside the oyster, right? You need the oyster, but what's more valuable, a pearl or an oyster, <laughs> right? So that's sort of the catch-22 that you have. Um, there's lots of questions and also lots of low-quality questions will never develop pearls, right? If you have really bad oysters, Nobody's going to go to your site. <laughs> so there's some, a lot of subtlety around questions versus answers in the system because answers are the real unit of work in that system. But at the same time, no questions, no answers. You're right about that. Um, the, I, I think the thing that, and we still struggle with this, I'm not at Stack Overflow, so I say we, I mean very broadly, is that if you ask a really simple question on Stack Overflow, you'll get reputation. Because simple questions are easy to answer. There's nothing wrong with a simple question, right? That's what you know, Stack Overflow is for. Simple, hard, doesn't matter. Um, but it might be a duplicate of the same simple question that's been asked like hundreds of times. And identifying duplicates is really, really hard. It's like work for everyone involved. So I would say if you want to seed a system, it sounds like that's what you're getting at, is just start with some relatively simple questions to get people in and then sort of ramp up the difficulty a little bit and make sure that the quality level is high. The quality level has to be high of your questions, otherwise you don't get pearls, right? So there's the symbiotic relationship between the two, but the simple questions are kind of how you make that work, at least in the beginning. Thanks. Yep. Uh, yes, you. Right, so the community helped us figure out what kind of questions should be allowed and disallowed on Stack Overflow because the ultimate goal is learning. And there's a lot of questions that seem like you're learning, but they're really just opinion questions. Like, you know, what's the best Java framework? Right, well, first of all, what does that even mean, best framework? Like, what are you trying to do? You sort of have to teach people <laughs> to ask questions that can really be answered that don't devolve into, this is my opinion and this is why it's interesting, which is actually a huge problem on Quora that they don't actually still understand is that you can't really sustain a system like that, in my opinion. So the community helped us figure, th figure this out because one question, one type of question that was allowed early on in Stack Overflow was career questions of, you know, I'm a programmer, I'm trying to do certain things in my career, what should I do? And we were like, okay, this should be allowed. But the community voted very decisively that they didn't like these questions. And I think ultimately they were correct because everybody's situation is different and all those questions end up being very opinion-based and very situational. You know, and you can't come up with a good, concrete, fact and data-based answer for someone having a career conundrum, like, my boss is a jerk to me, what should I do? It's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> Get another job, right? Like, <laughs> it, these are very difficult questions to answer. They, they seem on topic, but the reputation system, the one, sort of, let me finally, one final thing. The one surprising thing that emerged with Stack Overflow was the power of this reputation system. Even knowing all the things that I know about putting numbers next to people's names, that once you have reputation in the Stack Overflow system, you start to look very skeptically at the way other people got reputation. And if people got reputation for, hey, this is, you got all your reputation from, up, from a cartoon that you didn't even create, that you posted as a funny answer to a funny question. That's not fair, right? I don't like that, and therefore that has to go, right? And I think they're fundamentally correct. They're, they're enforcing the integrity of the reputation system, but they get really, really strict, much stricter than we intended the system to be initially. 
So the reputation kind of drives people towards strictness. I don't think this is a bad thing because I, I think in systems of learning, strictness is necessary to keep things on the rails. But that was one of the most surprising findings was just how strict the community will get enforcing the reputation system and the value of where reputation comes from. You know, it has to be something that is deep programming that matters. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sure, sorry. Yeah, so as gamification continues to build as a buzzword and a, and a movement, so to speak, uh, there's all these different resources, Badgeville, Bunchball, uh, books. What would you say are the most valuable resources for somebody wanting to build technology that implements gamification? I like this guy, uh, Sebastian Detterding. Um, you can look him up. Um, I, I can't think of any links off the top of my head, but Sebastian Detterding is his name. He has some really good presentations about the pitfalls of this stuff. I think the way to think of game design is, you know, first think the behaviors that you want to have. That's what you're designing the game for. But you need to really think through the behaviors that you don't want and the side effects of the systems that you're creating. In other words, what I call designing for evil. Like, you, you have to really design for evil. You have to design a system that's highly resistant to um, getting torn apart, right, by people that are t attacking it or inadvertently just they think they love it, but they love it too much and they, they, they break the system. So. One example of where that can get really weird is Hacker News just experimented with the system, which we've talked about on Discourse but haven't done, where every new comment on Hacker News would have to be vetted by other users with at least 1,000 karma on Hacker News. That's a really big, deep change. And it was funny because Paul Graham was like, oh yeah, I'm leaving Y Combinator, I'm just gonna make this change before I leave. I was like, I was like that's not a good idea, <laughs> right? Like, this is a really deep change in the community and to make it so quickly and before you're leaving just, just seems really dangerous. So stuff like that is really deep game design stuff. You want to think like what, what's going to happen if on, the only people that can comment on Hacker News now are the people who get their comments approved by other users. You really need to think that through and actually probably discuss it with the community. You know, because I proposed a lot of things on Stack Overflow uh, and I proposed them on Meta first. It's like what if we did this? And the community would say, well, what, you know, they would, they would tear it down for me. They would break it down. Like the ways this is going to go wrong. The behaviors you're going to see that you don't really want, you know. So I think it's, it's an iterative, ongoing process, and I think you have to involve your community in the, in the design uh, of the game. But, you know, we built the Frankenstein monster, right? We started with the things we saw that were working, and we took just those elements that were working, and we pieced them together. So I think that's another good way to look at this. Like, what do you, look at Stack Overflow. Look at the work that we did and say, what do you like about Stack Overflow? What do you think works really well and why? And what doesn't work so well? And just take those pieces out and move them forward. You know, the best, ex the best proof of concept is a functioning website, I think. So, okay, thanks. All right, thanks everyone.